Lord God, I just submit to you, Father, spirit, soul, and body, that you would speak out of me, Lord. It wouldn't be my mind at all. It would be simply what you want us to hear that will increase our, in, increase our individual walks with you. Father, bless every family here and those who couldn't make it. Lord, those that are watching by camera, oh, so many of them now. Lord, we bless them. We want them to have the best Christmas in Jesus' name. Come, Holy Spirit, open the eyes of our understanding. Open our heart to receive word, the word on good ground. And help us to let go of things from yesterday. And hold dear to the things you have for us right now and in the days to come. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, we're going to call this the gift. See, I'm not, I'm not any better. <laughs> That's exactly why I didn't want it tossed at me. I'm not any better, you know. So I try to get it up so everybody, hey, get on it. Notice it's not heavy. He ain't heavy. Okay. All right. So Christmas 2022, amen, the gift. Now, I've been teasing my wife about a gift exchange. Welcome to God's gift exchange. What do you mean, Pastor Kerry? Well, the Father gave his best gift to us. Amen. We received that gift. His name is Jesus. And all our life now, we try to do our best to give out Jesus. Can you say amen? So it's like a gift exchange. Everyone says, I got it. So everyone say, I got it. I give out what God gives to me. There you go. I'm going to separate you two. <clears throat> Man, I tell you what, God is so exciting, so good, answers so many prayers. Yesterday was, I could just spend an hour talking to you about that. All right, let me, let me really say, so Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas. Let's do it again. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas. Amen. And Merry Christmas to those coming through the camera. Amen. What a special time of the year. It's our prayer that you have not lost your joy. And your love for this season. Because of all the hustle and bustle. I haven't heard that term for a long time. Coming up again next week on Saturday night. We're going to have a celebration service. To give the gift of salvation is the greatest thing that you and I can do about Jesus. As we sow, so shall we what? Reap. Everyone says, well, Christmas is a pagan tradition. If you ever hear people talking that, it says, you really don't know, do you? And they say, no, what? Remember when you talk to people who think they know? Talk to them as if they don't. And they'll want to know. Hope you're writing notes. Okay? Because you got somebody that thinks they know everything. And then you ask them a question that they don't know. You got their attention. Jesus did a lot of times. Remember the Pharisees came to him and says, Jesus, John's baptism. You know? What is it? A God? A man? You know, and then Jesus uh, countered with a question. Hey, what do you think? <laughs> so a lot of times we need to analyze how we look at something. Is it a tradition? Is it at man's religion? Or is it actually the truth of scripture? Can you say amen? A quick thing, I'm going to throw it out. Um, do you remember... At the nativity. Who was at the na nativity? The manger. Well, we have animals, shepherds. And we have what? Huh? The baby. Yeah, mother and Mary. But I want to tell you something. There are some that we depict in our nativity that weren't there. Can you tell me who they were? They were the wise guys. I'm going to do a little play uh, next Christmas, maybe called the wise guys. And the wise guys, they were kings of the east. Now listen to me carefully. I know you love to talk, but listen to me carefully. The wise guys, the, the wise kings, they went and made a mistake to Herod and says, hey, there's going to be a king born in Israel. And Herod, he was the only king. He going to wipe out any other kings. And so when they went back, they knew that Herod was going to send out an edict to kill all these children at this certain age. And so they knew they were being followed. So they took two years to get to where Jesus was. 
So he was, they weren't there at his, his, at his birth. They came two years later. And by that time, if you read it, now I'm not trying to change anything. If you read it, Jesus is already in a house, not a manger. And he's already older. So it tells us that Satan really looked to get and snuff uh, Jesus out. And so God had such wisdom. He showed the shepherds, everybody else. He showed the kings, but then he said, hey, you take off another way. And then you get here when I tell you to get there. Can you say amen? So traditionally, our nativity has got to be changed forever, Pastor Curry. What are we going to do? No, I'm, I'm just kidding. I really, first time I heard that, I thought, no. I love truth. Can you say amen? All right. So again. We want to give you the reflection to give the gift of salvation to other people is the best Christmas present that we can give. To receive Christ as your personal savior is the best gift you can get. Think on the heavenly father went all through everything to give us his wonderful gift of life. Now, it was the greatest gamble that you might have ever thought. Most people don't know for Jesus to be born in the earth, it was an absolute gamble and a miracle. Because when Jesus came, whose planet was this? Come on, Christian, it belonged to the devil. The Old Testament, you want to know why the Old Testament is so troubled? Why people's prayers took 21 days? Because Satan still had control of the atmospheric parts of the earth. So God had to find a way to bring his son into the earth. Well, he's God. He could just do anything. No, he can't break the law. He can't lie to you. He can't force your will. So you need to understand how he set things up and start living that way. Can you say amen? God had to get his son into the earth legally so that he could become a man, receive our sins, and shed pure blood like never before. And so we know the story I told you last week, how that the seed be of the woman would bruise his head. And he came in the volume of the book, which is written of him. In other words, my wife said, what does that mean? I said, think of it. God's outside the planet. He needs somebody to invite him in their house. So a fellow named Abraham came along and he got tired of living in Sumer, Samaria, and worshiped other gods, Anunnaki. And he says, God, there's going to be something more than this. And God says, that's all I need. And it was an invitation to show up. Read it. It's in Isaiah. It says that God cried out and says, God, is there a God? And it says that God showed up and he says, I am the El Shaddai. Though you be dead, yet shall you live. Woo glory to God. We invited God back into the earth because we threw him out. The earth God gave to man and said, you have dominion. Then he came in fellowship with man by their permission. Can you imagine that? So they could fellowship in the spiritual realm. And yet, man committed high treason and threw God out. And because God's legal... And because it would be against the law to remain, he has to obey his own principles. Say amen. So he's outside looking in. How did he get in? People invited him back in. How do I get into your house, Sherry? If I'm knocking at your door? What does Sherry say? Come on in, Pastor Kerry. And listen, here's one I'm going to throw at you. Many of you are inviting the wrong spirit in by talking problems all the time. Shut that door. Don't let the stranger in. If you have unforgiveness towards me, shut that door and say, Lord, I forgive them even though I don't like them. <laughs> Amen. So many people are so hindered because of themselves. All right, moving right along. We're going to look at the Christmas story. You remember the Christmas story? All right, go with me to Luke chapter 1, verse 36 through 38. The seed of the woman. Verse 26, it says, Now in the sixth month of the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, 
of the house of David. See the bloodline? The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angels said to her. Notice, it, the angel's totally polite. Okay. The angels said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, now remember, these things are frightening. She was troubled at his saying and considered the manner of greeting this was. And then the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You know, that all about the angels all the time. They show up, people get afraid and they say, don't be afraid. Because <laughs> they're huge. We think there's no little baby angel flying around with wings. In your Sunday school class, you see, like we've been depicted. Who do you think find that foolishness? No, they're huge, at least seven to eight feet tall. Okay, and they have to appear human like to humans. That's God's edict. Why? Because it would scare the believing Jesus out of us, and Jesus we need to keep. <laughs> they're huge. And folks, every one of you are assigned to. They go with you everywhere you go. But because we don't speak the word, we speak the problems. We fight amongst our wife and kids and stuff like that. Angels are all bound up. They can't minister to you. Because you're not giving them any gasoline. Gasoline is the words of God for angels. All right, moving past. Then it goes on, don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, in your, uh, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name what? In the Old Testament, it's Joshua. In New Testament, it's Jesus. Same. Okay. You'll read in Hebrew sometime. It says, if Joshua could have gave you that rest, and everybody goes, Jesus, no. Joshua was of the Old Testament. His job was going into the promised land and give the Israelites a form of rest and grace towards God. What happened? Oh, amen. But Joshua couldn't give the rest, but Jesus did. Can you say amen? So the word Joshua in the Old Testament is the word Jesus in the new. Just in case you didn't know that. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom there will be no end. Some would say, I'm a part of that kingdom. Amen. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be? How can this be? Since I know not a man. And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and this power of the highest will overshadow you. And therefore the Holy One that is in to be born, he shall be called the Son of God. Amen. Three in heaven, Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. Psalms 107 verse 20 says he sent forth his word. That's Jesus. And the word became flesh. John 1.14. And we beheld his glory. The glory of the begotten, begotten of the Father. Full of grace and truth. We behold him. Folks, you're beholding everything else but God. And that's why we're not having the results that we need. Somebody wiggles and immediately your head turns. How quickly are we distracted away from our walk with God? How easily are we disturbed? Analyze yourself so no one else does. <laughs> it's getting quiet in here. Anybody else around? There we go. Keep it to you. <laughs> we keep it. You see, you got to catch the truth and practice the truth. That's what sets the three. Whether it comes out of my mouth, your mouth, it doesn't matter. But it comes out, if it comes out and it's the word, pay close attention and don't be disrespectful. All right, two, Luke. Let's go to Luke chapter two and let's look at the birth of the gift. Jesus Christ, our Savior. So Luke chapter two, verse one says, and it came to pass in those days, the decree went out from Caesar Augustus to all the world to be registered. And the census took 
place in, in, by, uh, while Quantius was governor of Syria. And so it all went to be registered, everyone to their own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, to a place called, in Judea, to a city of David, which is called what? Now what you don't realize is Bethlehem is, how many's ever been to South Prairie? I used to live there for seven years. That's why it's so blessed. No. <laughs> no. South Prairie hardly has anything in it. It's just kind of, Bethlehem is the same way. We think Bethlehem is a bustling city and all that. City of David. Are you kidding? They couldn't even find a hotel. He lived in a manger, which was a rock outcropping. I seen it. We walked by, by it. There's a restaurant up there when I toured Israel. Anyway, it's a rock outcropping, and Jesus was in it where they kept the animals. Jesus is in that manger area. It was just a dive city. In fact, the scripture says that when people talked about Bethlehem, they said, Can anything come out of Bethlehem that's good? You see? And yet it was prophesied that the Messiah would come out of obscurity and change the world. Can you say amen? I would say Bethlehem at that time was quite a bit obscure. <laughs> David! It's kind of like living in South Prairie. All right, moving on. Are you still with me? So, it says, because he was of the house of the lineage of David, he registered with Mary, betrothed his wife, was there with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were completed, and she delivered. Wonderful. And she brought forth the firstborn son. What born? Very important. Firstborn. Okay, firstborn son. Okay, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for the end. Swaddling cloths, folks, were big diapers. Hadn't been used or washed. They haven't been washed. They wrapped him in a big diaper. How many didn't know it? It's a swaddling cloth. Now, some people have tried to say it's even worse than that. Just a bunch of cloth they used for different things. There was nothing else. Here's your savior being wrapped in a diaper. <laughs> now, folks, let me ask you. Was Jesus God then? Yes. Yeah, Jesus was God in the spirit. But he was in the baby's body. So do you think he knew everything in, while he was growing up? Yes. No. It says he grew in wisdom and knowledge. That means he had to have his diapers changed. He had to learn to eat, to walk, do all that. He grew in the wisdom. See. So no. He was in spirit God. But in the flesh, a baby. <laughs> and God had to really protect him. We've seen all the activities and we know at that time, this world still belonged to the devil. I know that sounds terrible and I'm not trying to disrupt anything. But the Old Testament all the way up until the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ was locked up. I'm going to say this. No one could leave the planet. Folks, in the Old Testament, they didn't go to heaven. They went to paradise in the earth. Abraham's bosom. Most people don't. Satan wouldn't let anybody go to God. Aren't you glad we're in the New Testament? Amen. And that's why the first Adam failed, but Jesus is called the last Adam because he completed it, said it is finished. And he says, now you by faith believe in me and I'll carry you out of here. If you won't believe in me, you're going to stay. All right, look at your neighbor. Say, do you believe in him? You're going to go. You see, everybody should be checking every so often how they're doing before God. And then be quiet enough to listen to what he says to you to work on. And then remember, he's going to work with you on it. Man, I don't, I don't know how you could fail. This is why, I mean, God shared me one day with me and he was talking to me and I said, oh God, but so many people are having so many troubles and everything like that. And then God's, 
I love what he does. He says, Carrie, do you know why they're doing it? I says, are they doing it? He says, yeah, you don't think I'm doing it. I'm not giving them any trouble. And so where's that trouble coming from? Well, it's coming from the enemy, yeah. But the enemy can't do anything. I stripped him and I wiped him out. All he can do is trick you through fear into believing he can do something. Did you get that? That's just distraction to miss what I just said. Just kidding. I said, Satan has been stripped of all supernatural power. All he can do is lie and deceive. So where does he get his power? He comes to unsuspecting Christian that says, God really don't love you anymore because nothing working out for you. Wear a mask and die. Whatever. And then we get hit by fear. And as soon as we start fearing, his voice becomes louder than God's voice. And we start to stray away. When Jesus came to his disciples after he rose from the dead, they were all gathered in. Remember, he appeared through the room and he showed up. What was the first thing he said? Mark 16. He rebuked them for their unbelief. So why are you sitting here? I'm resurrected from the dead and you're all doubting. And you know what the problem of the church is Jesus Christ? Is you doubt leaders, you doubt each other, you doubt sometimes ourselves. And because you do that, you give Satan too much control and he's a lost cause. Don't give the enemy any control over your life. Say amen. And so what do I do, Pastor Kerry? First of all, perfect love casts out fear. If you got any fear at all, you're not meeting with God enough. He drives that fear out of you by meeting with him. That's why you never pray. It's always some calm cast prayer. Oh God, get me through today. And you barely make it. Moving on, I'm meddling. You know what I'm saying is, Christians' own problems is their own fault. Notice I paused there. I, I told God, I told God, I can't be right. I said, well, son, and God would say to me, son, everything that went wrong in your life, did I do it? No. Did the devil do it? Well, not really. He needed you, right? Yeah. He convinced you that it was okay and you acted on it and it became sin. So instead of doing it, come to me and let me show you how to filter that out of you. Every good and every perfect gift comes from the Father of lights, in whom there's no variable, just no shadow of turning. Amen? That means if it's not good, it's not perfect, then something else is operating. Stop and go to God. Say, thank you for that million dollar wisdom. And that's exactly what it is. We don't go to God, we think about it first. It can be disastrous when you do that. Are you with me? So, now that we're in the same county, this is verse 8, many shepherds living out the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. Behold, the angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of God overshone about them, and they were greatly afraid. There we go, that prayed again. That's because these things are huge. We don't get that in church. We don't get the truth. We get some kind of powdered down thing. Angels were so tr terribly horrifying they had to dumb down their appearance for the godly people but they would just amplify it for the devil hello i mean you think the way that they talk about the devil in the old testament that gabriel had to fight 21 days to get back in with an answer to prayer to daniel and on and on that's the way it was but in the new testament we have a terminology called pray through. Everyone say prayed through. Pray through. Do you know what pray through means? Father in Jesus name. Now you're through. What they're saying by that. Let me explain. Is that they have to keep pounding that atmosphere. And driving the devil back. Pray it through. Pray it through. But see that's Old Testament. That's old Pentecostal teaching. And that's okay. But you see the way that. We punch through all of the hindrances is by the use of Jesus' name. 
And that day you shall ask me nothing, he says, but whatever you ask the Father in my name. No one could come to the Father except, now listen, through me. Jesus is the carrier unit that puts us in a place of communion with God where Satan is out of the picture until you open your mouth or do something silly. How many times have you heard somebody said, and you probably heard them say that, but they really didn't say that, and you got mad at them because you thought they said that. Now, now you're beginning to understand Satan's realm. Get out of your head into your heart. Okay. And so we can see what's happening. A baby in swaddling cloths, and then verse 14, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, what? Peace and good will to men, okay? Verse 15, so it was the angels had gone away into heaven and the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing, okay, which uh, shall come to pass and the Lord has made known to us. And they came and they haste and found Mary, Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. And now when they had you notice there's no wise man concerning the child. And all those that heard and marveled at these, and those things were all told them by the shepherds. We'll just stop right there. Now, my first point to you is the promise of the gift. How many know God keeps his promises? He promised you eternal salvation, right? Is it something that you have to work for? It's a gift. How do you receive a gift? You reach out and you take it by faith. Amen. God gives you the gift of salvation. Then it's in package form. Let's see if I can do this without falling over the Christmas tree. And God gives you a gift. And it's wrapped. Do you know why he has Jesus wrapped up for you? Because he wants to unwrap him. And enjoy what you're going to behold. You see. But foolish humans. You see. I, I used to teach my elders years ago. I'd give them a plant. So you tell me you're so good with people. Keep this plant alive. <laughs> plant? I'm no botanist. Yeah. I tell you what. You might not be any person that can really help somebody either if you don't have the right heart and you don't know how to take care of things. Got to know how to take care of things. I give you a pin. See how long you can keep it and take care of it. That pin represents Christ to you. We gave you a coffee cup so that our ugly muggly will be a reminder. <laughs> we love you and we care about you and we want the best for you. But see, what you have to do by your own responsibility, you've got to hold the gift dear to you and begin to unfold it. Talk to God. Oh, God, look at that. Jesus did that for me. Oh, God, it's so wonderful. You see the difference? Making it personal. And then your walk will come on so live. People look at you and say, what have you been doing? I actually said that to you once. I said, whatever you're doing, keep on doing it. Because your countenance was like a bright light. Keep on doing the right things. Don't let those distractions pull you away from that. You're making good ground. All right. Genesis 3.15 says, this is the promise of the gift. And you shall eat dust all the days of your life. For I will put division between the woman's seed and between your seed. And the woman's seed will crush your head, Satan. And you will chase after him like some little rabbit trying to nip at his heels. That's the story of Christ. How many people wanted to snuff him? Yet they couldn't. And yet Jesus snuffed Satan's power, didn't he? Yes, yes he did. He said, I crush his head. See, now here's something. Please get this. Maybe some of you won't till maybe next year. And not because I'm anything. God has to give us revelation. Stop fighting with just your words. Don't rebuke the devil with your, with your natural man. You have God in here, right? 
ask God to teach you how to pull God out like a package and project him out of your mouth. Scott been talking about speaking and having it done. This is what I'm talking about, Scott. You see, right now God has to shut down all of our, what do we call it, shorts. Us shorting out power. And we've got to learn to build that powerhouse inside of us. So that when we come against a mountain. What is a mountain? A mountain is an obstacle from you getting here to there. It is nothing more. That's all it represents. And it, Jesus said. Come to me and pray to me. And I will remove the mountain. <laughs> no. He says, if you see what I did to this mountain, say to the mountain. Say, here's what people don't know. Now, God doesn't want you running around telling the devil and running around being a kind of a weirdo. He wants you to know that you got a bomb inside of you. that whips Satan every time you let him out. His name is God. You have a God bomb. So learn to talk right. Okay? So when something is happening, you blow them right out of the water. You remove the mountain. You pluck up the tree. It says if you say to this mountain, be thou removed, be plucked up and thrown into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart. Doubt. Doubt. What do you say? Doubt is when you believe God and you tell everybody I'm believing God, then out of the side of your mouth during the week you go, I wonder why it's not working. You just nullified all that prayer bomb. No, yeah. You've got spiritual Tourette's. It's coming out the side like some kind of barf and the other parts holding on faith. See, double mindedness is unstable. I know I kind of grossed you out there for a minute, but I want you to realize that it's your double tongue that usually hinders all of our prayers. So you have the package. So the next time the enemy starts threatening you and your family, let God out. You carry him around. Speak God. Don't speak the problem. Jesus hardly ever talked. He Hey, Sherry, let me just tell you why the leopard is the dude. Above. Jesus hardly ever talked about a problem. Always talk to it. Take note. There's a time for you to pray to the Father and, and ask him to get involved. But then there's a time for you to say, enough is enough. I'm not having it anymore. Right, Linda? And when you do that, poo, you call the devil's bluff. You call the devil's bluff. And God just goes, out of there, buddy. You liar. Remember, the devil's defeated. He's hoping he's got still some audience with you. So let's get on the rest of the message. <laughs> Three days ago, I got bombed myself by... I just overdid it, and so I'm o overcoming. I'm not sick or anything, but I tell you, even the best of us get symptoms. So don't freak out. You're not sinning. Sometimes symptoms happen, and when you do that, go to God, and you start talking and, and, and fellowshipping. It's not because you did something wrong. It's probably you didn't do enough praying, but it, it's not a really big deal. So Genesis says the seed's coming. Can you say Amen. Go with me to Micah 5, verse 2. Listen to this. This is the one that talks about Bethlehem. Micah 5, 2 says, dealing with Christ. But you, Bethlehem, Euphrata, though you be little among all the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me, one to rule in Israel, whose goings forth is from everlasting to everlasting. Isn't that good scripture? Tells you that God uses the foolish things of this world come from the wise. Isaiah 7.14 is the next prophecy of calling it coming into the volume of the book. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. 
What sign? Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean? God with us. Now you think about it. He's not only with you, but Emmanuel, God in me. He's with us, but he's in us. He's for us, and we're in him. Get that. God is with us. God is for us. God is in us, and we're in God. That's New Testament. Anything lesser than that is not New Testament. To say God is leading me through the mud and the crud and he's teaching me something through the things I'm suffering is Old Testament is not New Testament and you just slapped Jesus in the face and insulted his work. Now we don't know that because we're not taught well. We live in churches where you get a 15 minute serve of beautiful music. It's all wonderful. Lots of people. You ask people when they come out of church, what did you get out of the sermon? And very few of them can tell you. That's scary. You're sitting in the back and I'm going to start asking you what you're retaining. And I'm amazed because people are acting as if they haven't heard a thing. Lately, in the last couple of weeks, what is it, Christmas and you forgot the word? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. You need the word to share it. You don't want to share yourself. <laughs> Amen. All right, let's go with me to Isaiah chapter 9. I meddle enough. How are we doing good? Christmas. Isaiah 9, verse 6 and 7 says, For unto us a child was born, and unto us a son was given. Do you understand the difference? Hello? Go ahead. Unto us a, a child was born. Do you understand that? Birth of the seed. But then he says, And unto us a son was given. Jesus was given. To die for our sins. He came as a child. But he died for our sins. So this scripture means exactly that. For unto us a child was born. Unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulders. His name will be called wonderful. Counselor. Mighty God. Everlasting father. Prince of peace. Of the increase of his government. And peace. If you have him in your heart. There will be no end. Say amen, somebody. Amen. And then the gift given, James chapter 1, verse 16 through 18. The gift given. Here it says to a lot of Christians, you need to focus on you not being deceived. Stop trying to correct other Christians. If you're a wife, the worst thing you can do as a wife is henpeck your husband. Nip at him and like some kind of little thing. You need to be pulled over a knee and your bottom slapped. You need to respect men and you need and men need to love their their children. But we do it all wrong. We the wife thinks if she doesn't complain against her husband, he's never going to learn. And, and the husband says if he doesn't help her, she's always going to be that one brick shy of a full load. It was a joke. So the gift given, James says, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift. What gift? Every perfect gift. What gift? Is from above, comes down from the father of lies. Now listen. Which whom there is no changeable variableness, nor shadow of turning. God's not going to get mad at you one day and turn on you, Terry. Ever. You have God in your heart, even though you have covered him up for a while. Now you're uncovering him. And so God's going to do everything in his benefits to try to bring you into that walk he's planned for each one of us to have. But it's up to us to yield to it, to go to God faithfully and allow him to do the work and not us. Say amen. I preach myself so happy. I feel like singing jingle bells. All right, so let's go on. Yeah. So it says this, he says, after he says about good things and perfect things, then he says, of his own will. It's God's will that he brings us forth. Now listen, by the word of truth. So here, God brings us out of ourselves. You're like a caterpillar 
or a moth, and you're, you're getting ready to turn into a butterfly. What do they do? They build a cocoon and they crawl within themselves. And the change metamorphosizes in that. And then one day they break loose out of their cocoon and they're a butterfly. Well, God is bringing us out of ourselves. But we have to go to his word and get enough understanding so he can pull the real us out. Can you say amen? I don't know about you, but I don't like looking at you in the carnal state. You know, what do you mean, Pastor Kerry? I don't like seeing that you have problems. I don't like hearing that you need prayer. It's okay, and we do that. But you know what? I love seeing what God is doing in your heart because he's transforming us all. So let me ask you, if you still feel a little bit like a caterpillar, what should you be doing? Meeting with God, getting in the word. Amen. And then God hides you in that cocoon and you metamorphosize. Remember, the cocoon is your flesh, a type of your flesh, but also a type of God hiding you. What do you mean hiding? Well, the Bible says simply that we are hidden in Christ in God. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? So how does Satan get you away from God? He appeals to you, bunky, and your lusts. And he pulls you away from your attention on God into your attention on yourself and then does something to irritate you. So you start spreading things that he feeds on like a vampire. What feeds the devil? Have you figured it out yet? Our sin, our anger, our fighting with each other, our argument, unforgiveness, all feeds the devil just like an electric plug-in. You want to cut the devil's power? Walk in love and forgive instantly everything, everyone that ever trespassed and go to God and say, God, empower me. Immediately Satan is broken. But we don't. We wait. We wait until we get so miserable. Now it's a real battle. No, come on. You need to be taught right. Why are you still going to a church that isn't teaching you? I don't know. Am I? I don't know. You be the judge. Are you still having the same problems you had last year? If you are, you're not learning. You're not growing. And don't get mad at me. I'll throw the football at you. <laughs> I'm trying to encourage you. If you're going to get anything, if you're going to get frustrated, get mad at yourself. And then find friends that will pray with you and, and work with you and point you in the right direction. Because there are people sitting here right now are doing your own thing and you're getting no rewards. And that's not fun. You're a child of God. Remember the deceiver now. All right, everyone say amen. amen. Every, good Every good gift. All right, so my next point is finding, receiving, and unwrapping your gift. We talked about that early. Today, how was your prayer time? Now, I'm not saying that to make you feel bad because Satan would have made you forgot about him. It's church. I don't spend time with God for church. <laughs> Please, I'm not trying to make you feel bad. But why are we starting our day still without dwelling with God? Hello? I don't even want to take my carnal self out to somebody's house without God. <laughs> Oh, uh, my wife can tell you back in the day when I was so miserable and everything, you wouldn't want to invite me anywhere. Because if I seen something you were doing wrong, I'm going to let you have it. No. <laughs> Thank God I've been redeemed. My, I hope my, our friends watching on camera get a good laugh out of some of this. Okay. Finding and receiving and unwrapping. Number one, when we search, we shall what? Find. So searching and finding the gift of God is Daily, folks, too. Receiving your gift and, and with expectation and thanksgiving shows reverence and respect. God just loves it. And thirdly, unwrapping your gift to study the word and understand the principles of it. Say amen. Second point is the gift is to be enjoyed and cherished. He has become your friend, hasn't he? You see, I am a friend of God. 
I can actually say, now let me relate this to you. I, have a, I had a wonderful dad. He was a very good man. He was not perfect. He wasn't first. He wasn't saved. Then he got saved and just a wonderful man. You know, and the real neat thing about him is, is that he really cared about his kids. So in caring for us, it's very important that we understand that we, it takes a little time to become your dad's friend or even husband and wife situation. How many, I'm not going to say how many years been married and it didn't work out. I'm not going to say anything like that a lot. But you don't marry just to marry. First of all, if you are a woman, do not marry a man that hasn't got enough spiritual knowledge as you do. Listen to me carefully. Because if you do, you'll become his babysitter and his mother. And that's not a good thing. So listen, it's okay for a man to have a woman that don't know as much as that man. Because a man's authoritative figure and he can help. But if you reverse those things, it doesn't work. Well, I married him. I know God and I'll change him. <laughs> That's a prideful thing to say. God resists the proud. Now how are you going to get any help? You see, so when you marry, equally yoke. And listen, some of you say, I'm not even thinking about it now in my time of age. Well, who knows? God might have some sweet person for you. Last couple of years of your life. You never know. The idea is, if they're not spiritually together, you don't need a spiritual deficit to marry. <laughs> hey, excuse me, I'm going to marry that flat tire there. <laughs> you know, the guy can't get out and find a job. <laughs> yeah, but he's cute. He's real cute. I'm talking to you. This, folks, going to church is not where you find a man or a woman. All the broken people are here. God brings you together and he works it all out. And that's when the rest of us be quiet and don't meddle. Amen. Because you might think, oh, that's not going to work. Who made you God? And those of you that love to kind of put people together, stop that. How would you like to put heckle and jekyll together? You know, my goodness. You're not a matchmaker. Stop it. God's the matchmaker. Now, if God tells you to encourage somebody, that's great. But don't run around and say, ah, oh, I see you married to her. And you'll say, that's funny, I'm already married. <laughs> hey, I had, if Peggy was here, she would tell you, huh, Peggy? Yeah, she will tell you. When I was preaching my first church years and years ago, we, people would come in the office and I'll be preaching and everything like that. Women from Canada, stuff would come in the office and say, I'm going to marry that man. Ask Peggy about it. I forgot all about that. And Peggy would start yelling at him and I said, are you dumb? So he's already married. <laughs> you see, people get into spiritual weirdness. I, I ran into a group God forbid. They were token in Jesus, wrapping their pillow. They were at a retreat. Roll their pillow up like a joint. And then pretend they're sucking in whatever, the Holy Spirit. Where do you come up with stuff like that? That's because they're trying to follow God in their brain if they had one. If they had one. And that's what happens. Come on in. Take a seat. Good to see you. Merry Christmas. And so you think about that. Let's go back on. All right. Everyone say. The gift is to be enjoyed and cherished. Never go tired of Jesus. Never sit in a congregation. So I've heard that before. I know that. You do that. Guess what? God will make you eat humble pie for a week. How will he do that? He says, well, if you know it, prove to me you know it. Don't be so quick to brag in front of God what you know and what you don't. 
Don't be so quick to say you're right and everyone else is wrong. That's why when I'm preaching, I make sure that I go to God and say, Lord, if I have misdone anything, cleanse me of it and don't let anything be a scar to anybody. I don't want to mislead anybody. And my wife will tell you and, and people will tell you that one of my prayers has always been, Lord, that I would teach the truth and I would not teach error. So at least, and if you follow it by life, and you can, uh, you can follow what I used to teach way back then. It's the same what I teach now, except for a lot more wisdom. <laughs> it hasn't changed. The gospel does not change. We're the one that needs our life lined up with it all the time. All right, so let's go on. So never go tired of the gift of Jesus and the word. Number two, never place the gift on a shelf. Blow that dust off your Bible. Take your Bible off the shelf. Number three, don't let the enemy steal this gift by telling you you're nothing. Stop saying what the devil tells you. The devil will say, God doesn't love you anymore because nothing's going right. So you talk about it. Don't ever do it. Jesus says, worry about nothing, right? Yeah. He says, take no anxious thought saying. Take no anxious thought saying. Take no anxious thought saying. When you do, you give Satan power. In other words, if you're a little anxious about it, just keep your mouth closed and say, God, it's yours. God, it's yours. Now you say, gosh sakes, I'm not scoring too good. I mean, I'm messing up in a lot of areas. Good. You're seeing this. I'm not trying to tell you you're doing things wrong. The word will point it out to you so that you can go to God and he can help you straighten it out. Your life is on trial. Did you know that? This world is a fallen planet of trials. Everywhere you go, there's tests and trials and everything. It has nothing to do with God. All has to do with the enemy testing you, hoping you're going to give up on God. All right. <laughs> and finishing. Fourthly, don't let others break this gift with a lie telling you you're not valuable. Everyone look at somebody and say, you're so valuable, God. You're the apple of his eye. You're the apple of his eye. You are so valuable to God. You're the apple of his eye. Get your eyes off yourself. Lest you stinketh. Okay. That means if, you know, I can't get my feelings hurt if I died. And my life is hidden in Christ. You could call me a booger and I wouldn't get upset. <laughs> Amen. But see, some of us, we live with chips on our shoulder. And I'm talking to you. And the enemy knows what those chips are. And he just come by with somebody and go, Bap! and your whole week is ruined. Get over that and grow up out of yourself. You should not let anything offend you other than sin and not affect you. You can be offended by something, but don't let it affect you. Your walk is very more important rather than to be troubled and effective over what you cannot change. So eyes off the world, eyes off others, eyes off ourself, uh, and put them on Jesus. Every bit of your problem, when you start getting negative and your mouth starts going, is when you got your eyes on you. Your focus on, I don't have, I need to. We better catch up on our bills. Those kind of things. And now our focus has changed onto us. And then the enemy starts hitting those little chips. All right. I'll move on. Point six. The best way to keep this gift fresh is to give it to others. Keep sharing Jesus. They yell at you and cuss at you. Just keep sharing. He says, you know, you're cussing at me. But I'm loving you. Thank you, Jesus. Hello. And people do that. Nikki Cruz. Remember Crossing the Switchblade? We should all show some of those old movies. Nikki Cruz, man. 
And he says, he, and Israel Narvez, Israel would take the offering and he'd pull out a switchblade and there'd be guys in there, you know, got $100 bills in their, in their wallet and everything. They'll pull out a five. And then it's a, it's a true testimony. And, Nick, and uh, Israel Narvez would pull out a switchblade and just kind of play with it by his ear. He's not threatening anybody with it. And he says, I think you ought to drop a few more things in there. <laughs> Truth. It's actually in the movie. You can kind of watch it. It's really cute. It's called The Cross and the Switchblade. Wonderful. You have somebody not saved. It's an excellent older movie to watch. All right. Are you with me? Remember, number seven, no other gift that we can receive is so precious and brings salvation. Can you say amen? But again, the gift has to be embraced, kept in the heart. And the gift, you have to say, God, help me unwrap it. And then he will unwrap it for you so that you can peer into the face of Jesus. And as we look into the face of Jesus, we're changed into the same glory. Why? Because truth's being revealed to us. Hope is being given to us. And power is being given working in us. And as we behold the gift and embrace the gift and unwrap the gift, we fall and become friends with God. Everyone say, I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. Abraham was called a friend of God. And he was Old Testament. You're New Testament. And God says, Who, who's coming to see me? <laughs> One day I asked God, I said, God, what's the problem out there? And he says, tell my people I haven't seen them for a while. They're too busy. I'm waiting for them to come and spend some time with me. I'm talking to all of you. Take the time to let him know how much you love him. If it's going to be very, very kind of uncomfortable feeling as you're sobbing and weeping and saying, God, I love you. But it's so refreshing and so life-changing. Say amen. We might cry because we feel bad. When's the last time we cried because we love God so much? You need to ask yourself that because you don't want yourself becoming so hard and religious that it insults God's grace. And finally, just for our sister over there, what name is above every name that's named in heaven and earth and under the earth? What name is given among men whereby we must be saved? What's his name, the highest name ever? Jesus. Jesus. Now, that does not leave the Father out. The Father said if we would lift Jesus up, much like Moses lifted up the serpent, which is a representative of Jesus, in the wilderness, so will God lift you up. So how much are you lifting yourself up and how much are you lifting God up? Ask God to show you and regulate it and you'll notice a difference as he helps you to lift up Christ. Doesn't he care about us? No, I'm going to tell you something. He lift up Christ and he will have you so taken care of. You'll go, gosh, Lord, that's wonderful. Priorities first. How many here have electricity in your house? And when the electricity is off, who do you call? Electric. You call the electric people because they're in charge of the electricity. When they turn it on, the lights are still off. What do you need to do? You, you need to go in and turn on the switch. Because the power company doesn't turn the switches on in your house. They just turn on the main power. Jesus turns on the main power, but you have the switch how much you're going to let and how much you're not. How much light do you want? How much light? God's not up there regulating you. Oh, yeah, today we're going to let Sherry go without. We'll teach her a lesson. No, flip the switch on. Lord, there's not enough light in here. I need more light. Have a, a joyous party. And, oh, Lord, God, thank you, Jesus. I mean, if there's nobody in your house, why not? Well, we don't necessarily do that. That's kind of embarrassing. Who are you embarrassed in front of? God? David danced in his underwear in front of the entire nation because he was overjoyed with God's presence. Now, he wasn't being disrespectful. He just wasn't caring 
how people manipulate him as a king. Folks, you're never going to manipulate me. And I'm never going to manipulate you. It's wrong. Our job is to enjoy God together. And let me encourage you to be with the Lord. All right. And finishing. So there is no salvation in any other name given in heaven. That we must be saved. That's Acts 4.12. Philippians 2. Listen to this. 9 and 11 says. Therefore God has highly exalted him. Given him a name which is above every name. That is the name of Jesus Christ. Every knee shall bow. Now listen carefully. Of things in heaven. Things in the earth and things where? See, that's what everybody forgets. Satan was cursed to crawl in the earth and under the earth. And if you know anything about the historic, all this underground uh, building and they're thousands of years old, that's his doing. Trying to hide from God. We can't ignore that. The pyramids. Here's one for you and then we'll, we'll close. Pyramid. There we go. The pyramid. Most amazing looking things. And you go, where did they come from? Well, number one, they didn't come from God. Two, God doesn't need to make a, a, a pyramid. But number two, they were made from Satan and his fallen angels. We call that the Atlantean civilization. Actually, that's just another name for fallen ones. Ben A. Elohim. Ben A. Elohim, fallen sons of God. All right, they created them. Now, one thing neat about the pyramids, if you look at it really careful and let God open your eyes, and of course, it's just for fun for me, is those were pre antediluvian structures before the flood. Those pyramids were built before Noah's flood and way back in the beginning. Because when you look at the Sphinx, it's got water damage. For thousands, maybe possibly millions of years all around it. And then the head was reshaped because it was a lion's head symbolizing God owns his planet. But then Satan got a hold of it, chipped the thing out, and made it into a pharaoh's head. Now, folks, where did Egypt come from? Come out of Sumer, out of the fallen ones. Why is there, you go along in our history... There's nothing. And suddenly cavemen who are hunter-gatherers are building pyramids and having established relations. It all biblical, folks. These are the fallen angels. The idea is they wanted the planet. Did they get it? No. God gave the planet to you. So what part are you going to let the devil and kick him off of? That's why it says under the earth. And see, folks, Christians are so. And then fighting amongst themselves. You ask them, hey, explain to me what it means to be born again. And they look at you like, oh, oh, that's scary. Okay, I teased you enough. Born again? What is that? What is that? Amen. I do that to keep people's attention. We got people sleeping back there, Tina. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> you know I'm joking with you, sis. All right, now, do you have any questions? I'm going to open it up because it's Christmas. Do you have any questions? Have I said anything you, you might have some problems with? Come to me later and discuss it. But you see, I've been studying this for over 45 years. My pastor taught us about all the plan of salvation. He taught us about the fallen ones. He taught us about all these things. So I came out of his Bible study knowing who I was. Satan says, man, we got to shut Kerry down because we don't shut him down. He's going to go around and share the gospel. Same with all of you. And so he began to work on my life. And he did a good job. He pounded on me pretty hard and he sent every kind of temptation you can imagine. I could write a book under a different author's name and guarantee it would be a bestseller because I would just simply explain all the affairs and all the things that came at me when I was a young Christian man. Wouldn't that be interesting? Tantalizing. <laughs> I can tell you 30, 40 women coming at you once. 
because they heard you got divorced. My dad, bless his heart. My dad had lost his mom, and they were old school, so he loved his mom. I loved my mom so much. They were in love, and, and they were close to their 50th anniversary, and she died when it was the 47th, and that Lou Gehrig's disease, and it was, just struck him really hard. And so he bought an RV and became a snowbird. Snowbird, which is, can be fun, but don't buy an RV. <laughs> they leak. Anyway, so just get yourself a a summer cabin somewhere, anyway. And so he would travel around, and he'd come back with these horror stories. I'd show up in these places. There's places down in Arizona that during the winter, winter time, it turns into huge cities, and during the summertime, it's so hot, everybody leaves. So you'll be down there, and right around uh, wintertime starts coming, all these snowboards from Canada and everything come down there, and suddenly a little place suddenly becomes 25,000. All trailers and RVs and everything. Of course, my dad, Mr. Innocent, he doesn't know the circuit of RVers. And he gets there and they all say, ah, a perspective. He doesn't look like he's married. My dad would tell me, he says, all hours of the night, he'd hear knocks on the door. Let me in, I'll keep you warm at night. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hey, knocking on the door. I got cookies for you. It's two o'clock in the morning. He finally, after about two years of that, came back and lived in our backyard, didn't he, dear? Yeah. Couldn't handle it anymore. So they come out of the woodwork. Let me tell you. Don't be thinking that, that you can't be tempted. Don't be thinking that you're untouchable. You get with God and let him make you untouchable, okay? Amen. And I can tell you horror stories. Horror stories. But I ain't going to bore you with it. Merry Christmas. Did you get something out of that? Give the Lord a hand clap. Amen. Amen.